please continue to stand by for today's conference. The call will begin momentarily. If you would like to ask a question, you may press star one. Please unmute your phones and state your first and last name when prompted. Again, please continue to stand by. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for standing by. As a reminder, today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, to please disconnect at this time. Your lines are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star followed by the number one to ask a question. Please unmute your phones and state your name when prompted. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Stephanie Kokomo. Thank you, you may begin. Good morning and welcome to this joint media briefing by the FDA and CDC on the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Stephanie Kokomo with FDA's Office of Media Affairs. In a moment, I will turn it over to Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, who will help moderate a question and answer portion following brief opening remarks by Dr. Peter Martz, Director of the FDA Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research, and Dr. Ann Shuket, the CDC's Principal Deputy Director. After the remarks, we will then move to the question and answer portion of the call. Reporters on the call will be in a listen-only mode until we open the call up for questions. As a reminder, this audio call is being recorded and live streamed on the FDA's YouTube channel. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. You will be given the opportunity for one question. With that, I will now turn the call over to Acting FDA Commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. This morning, the FDA and CDC announced that out of an abundance of caution, we're recommending a pause in the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine due to reports of six cases of a rare and severe type of blood clot following vaccine administration. We're recommending this pause while we work together to fully understand these events and also so we can get information out to healthcare providers and vaccine recipients. Right now, I'd like to stress these events appear to be extremely rare. However, COVID-19 vaccine safety is a top priority for the federal government. 
and we take all reports of adverse events following vaccination very seriously. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Peter Marks, Director of FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research for more information about these reports. Peter. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock. Together, the CDC and the FDA are reviewing data involving six reports of a rare type of blood clot called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST, in combination with low levels of platelets in the blood, called thrombocytopenia, in women ages 18 to 48 who presented with symptoms between 6 and 13 days after receiving the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Treatment of this specific type of blood clot is different from typical treatments for other types of blood clots, which usually involve an anticoagulant called heparin. With cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, heparin may be dangerous and alternative treatments need to be given, preferably under the guidance of physicians experienced in the treatment of blood clots. Of the clots seen in the United States, one case was fatal and one patient is in critical condition. While we review the available data, out of an abundance of caution, the FDA and CDC are recommending a pause in the use of this vaccine in the United States. The FDA will revise the fact sheet for healthcare providers administering vaccine and the fact sheet for recipient and caregivers for the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to include this adverse event information to ensure that healthcare providers are able to make appropriate benefit risk determinations for their patients. I want to reiterate what Dr. Woodcock said. Right now, these events appear to be extremely rare. That said, COVID-19 vaccine safety is a top priority for federal government, and we take all reports of adverse events following vaccination very seriously. Healthcare providers who see people presenting to them with either a low blood platelet count or blood clots should establish whether or not the individual has recently been vaccinated in order to inform the appropriate diagnostic evaluation and management. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Ann Shukat, the CDC's Principal Deputy Director, to speak to further explain our decision and next steps. Ann? Thanks so much, Dr. Marks. Um, I know that the information we're providing today is going to be very concerning to Americans who have already received the Johnson and Johnson or Janssen vaccine. And I want to let you know what we're doing to learn more and to protect people in the meantime and what you can do to be on the alert. As Dr. Marks mentioned, there have been six reports of a severe stroke-like illness linked to low platelet counts. Um, and more than 6 million doses of the J&J vaccine have been administered so far. While these events are very rare, we're recommending a pause in the use of the J&J COVID-19 vaccine in order to prepare the healthcare system to recognize and treat patients appropriately and to report severe events they may be seeing in people who've received the J&J vaccine. This pause will also allow the CDC's expert committee to review the situation. The safety of vaccines and the safety of the American people is of the utmost importance to us. The ACIP, or our Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, is the CDC's independent scientific expert committee on immunization matters. We are scheduling for them to convene tomorrow to review the data we have on these initial cases. This will allow careful deliberation about what we know so far about these events and consider next steps given the current context of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States and our broader immunization efforts. As a reminder, ACIP meetings are open to public viewing. Today, we're also alerting state health officials and other leaders in the states and cities, pharmacies and other healthcare providers who are administering the vaccine to make sure that they know about the pause and so clinicians know how to evaluate and report severe events after vaccination. Lastly, I know there are people who have gotten the vaccine who are probably very concerned. 
for people who got the vaccine more than a month ago, the risk to them is very low at this time. For people who recently got the vaccine within the last couple weeks, they should be aware to look for any symptoms. If you perceive the vaccine and develop severe headaches, abdominal pain, leg pain, or shortness of breath, you should contact your healthcare provider and seek medical treatment. Now, these symptoms are different from the mild flu-like symptoms, fever, and so forth that many people experience in the couple days after receipt of the vaccine. Importantly, there are three vaccines available, and we are not seeing these clotting events with low platelet counts with the other two vaccines. People who have vaccine appointments with the other two vaccines should continue with their appointments. Our partners are, will be working to reschedule people who have the J&J &J vaccine appointment in the days ahead. This may be a bit bumpy. We want to make sure that we're getting the word out to the public and to our providers, but um, we do want to make sure that people who are scheduled to have vaccination will be able to get that when vaccines available. We're committed to following the science and ensuring transparency and to providing regular updates. We're going to tell you what we know when we know it and what you can do to protect yourself. And our intention is to update you in the days ahead. I know this has been a long and difficult pandemic and a very long year and a half and that people are tired of the steps that they need to take and are keen to be able to be vaccinated. The steps we're taking today are meant to make sure that the healthcare system is ready to diagnose, treat, and report, and that you, the American public, has the information you need to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shuket. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the briefing. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Operator will take the first question. Thank you. And once again, that is star one if you would like to ask a question. Our first question comes from Karen Stacy. You may go ahead and please state your outlet. Thanks very much. This is Karen Stacy from the Financial Times. This obviously looks like the same thing that's happening with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the contacts that you've had with regulators in Europe. Uh, about that, and also whether there's any evidence of similar events happening with Moderna and Pfizer at all. Certainly. This is Janet Wincock. Uh, we are in constant contact with the regulators worldwide and uh, looking at uh, adverse events experienced in different regions. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Marks to answer in detail. No, thanks very much. So, um, you asked about whether there were similar cases with the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines, and there have been over 180 million doses of these vaccines administered. And at this time, we've not found any reports of uh, cerebral vein sinus thrombosis combined with thrombocytopenia. Operator, we'll take the next question. Thank you. That comes from Michael Ehrman. You may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, this is uh, this is Mike Ehrman from uh, from Reuters. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, just quickly, how how long the uh, the pause is expected to be? What's the minimum time? And also, whether you're considering limiting uh, vaccination for J and J to certain groups, like uh, people over 50 or all men and women over 50. Well, the time frame uh, will depend, obviously, on what we learn in the next few days. However, we expect it to be a matter of days for this pause. And I will maybe turn it over to Dr. Shuket to answer further. Yes, thank you, Dr. Woodcock. We, we are committed to an expeditious review of the available information and to an aggressive uh, outreach to clinicians so that they know how to diagnose, treat, and report. Um, one of the things that the ACIP deliberation will do is review the data on the cases and the context of risks, benefits, and possible subsets of the population that may be um, in a different category. So I think the, um, our intent is in the days ahead to
to provide an update regularly and that the pause provides us time for deliberation and assuring uh, appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Uh, operator will take the next question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Elizabeth Weiss. You may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, uh, USA Today. I had a question, and maybe this is for Dr. Marks. Do you have any sense of what the mechanism behind this might be? What could potentially be causing this? Yeah, well, we have hypotheses. This is Janet Woodcock. Uh, Dr. Marks, maybe you want to enlarge upon that. Yeah, so so thanks very much. We don't have a definitive cause, but um, the, the probable cause that we believe may be uh, involved here that we can speculate is a similar mechanism that may be going on with other, uh, the other adenoviral vector vaccine. That is that this is an immune response uh, that occurs very, very rarely um, after some people receive the vaccine. Uh, and that immune response uh, leads to activation of the platelets and these extremely rare blood clots. Yes, yeah, so to be specific, this is Janet Woodcock. The person being vaccinated makes an immune response potentially that actually involves their own uh, platelets or other parts of the coagulation system and can cause this problem. And that's the sort of leading uh, theory or hypothesis about what's going on here. Operator, we'll take the next question. Thank you. And that comes from Matt Preen. You may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, thanks with the Associated Press. Thanks for taking questions. Can you talk a little bit more about just how the SBA determined that, that these six events uh, out of, you know, almost 7 million injections uh, constitute a signal? Um, I mean, what, what would have been the background rate for a type of event like this uh, if, if, there is, um, if there is another explanation possible? Certainly, this is Janet Woodcock. This was a ex extensive work between the CDC and the FDA uh, on, on this uh, set of events and analysis uh, to see, you know, exactly what you're um, asking about. So, Dr. Marks, would you like to respond? Yeah, thanks very much. So, um, the the issue of cerebral venous uh, veins, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, those, the background rate of that is probably somewhere between 2 and 14 per million people. But that's in the setting of a normal platelet count. The combination here, the, the real thing that is so notable here is not just the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or the thrombocytopenia. Those two things can occur. It's their occurrence together that makes a pattern, and that pattern is very, very similar to what was seen uh, in uh, Europe uh, with another vaccine. So I think we have to uh, take the time to make sure we understand this uh, complication uh, and we address it properly. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question. Ann Flaherty, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, this is Ann Flaherty with ABC News. Um, so what would you say to people who are concerned and um, frustrated that they think this might be an overreaction, considering it's six people in, out of seven million? I would uh, ask Dr. Uh, to uh, sure. respond to that. Okay. Sure. You know, it, we are committed to safety and transparency and to expeditiously learning as much as we can so that further steps can be taken. When we saw this pattern and were aware that treatment um, needed to be individualized for this condition, um, it was of the utmost important for us to get the word out. That said, the pandemic is quite severe and cases are increasing in a lot of places and vaccination is critical. So we want to make sure that we um, make some uh, recommendations quickly. Thank you. Operator will take the next question. Thank you. Jacqueline Howard, you may go ahead. Please state your outlet. 
thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm with CNN. And I would like to know more of, about the decision-making process for the pause. It seems like just yesterday we were told that this was something that was being looked into. And then this morning the decision was made. We also understand that some states uh, may be upset that they were not given a heads up. So is, is, can someone explain how did this decision happen quickly and why um, was the decision made and were states involved or given a awareness or heads up that the pause would happen. Thank you. Uh, sure, this Dr. Marks. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, maybe I can just start and, and then let Dr. Yeah. Marks uh, expand. Um, I wish that um, we had more time to get everyone prepared and that this could go as, uh, even more smoothly. We, um, as we learned about the issue with appropriate treatment, and uh, it, it was clear to us that we needed to alert the public. Um, we wanted, we included the pause in addition to the alert so that there was time for the healthcare community to learn what they needed to learn about how to diagnose, treat, and report. But um, the decision was based on the events that might occur between when we made that realization and when we got the word out. So it was a question of um, wanting to make sure we could be open with our concerns and prepare the healthcare community to, uh, to diagnose, treat, and report while the more detailed deliberation occurs tomorrow. I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Marks. No, I would just echo that the issue here with these types of blood clots is that if one administers the standard treatments that we as doctors have learned to give for blood clots, um, one can actually cause tremendous harm um, uh, or the outcome can be fatal. Um, so one needs to make sure that providers are aware that if they see people who have low blood platelets, or if they see people who have blood clots, they need to inquire about a history of recent vaccination and then act accordingly in the diagnosis and management of those individuals. The, this was taken rapidly in order to honor our commitment to the American public to ensure that any safety signal that came up during this vaccine rollout was fully addressed uh, in a transparent manner. Operator will take the next question. Thank you. Caroline Chen, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, I'm Caroline Chen at ProPublica. Um, I was wondering if the FDA has any sense of any subpopulations or medical histories that may predispose a person to this rare side effect, um, or even if you have a hypothesis on that at this point. I, this is uh, Jana Woodcock. I believe there are few, too few cases for us to uh, make that determination for this particular vaccine. We may um, uh, be hearing about more cases. We will look further into these. We'll have deliberations, as was just described tomorrow, about the details, uh, but we aren't prepared at this time to uh, signal, you know, out, single out any particular subgroup. Operator will take the next question. Thank you. Jackie Lee, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for um, having this call. I'm with Bloomberg Law. Um, I was hoping that someone could address kind of the, anything that you would suggest going forward regarding messaging for this. Um, I would anticipate that, you know, there could be some fears about this stoking some more vaccine hesitancy. And so, you know, what would you recommend to help providers to avoid that situation? <clears throat> Well, this is uh, Janet Woodcock again. Number one, you know, we, we've had several questions about <clears throat> related to this. I think we need to reiterate, we are committed to vaccination. We feel that is a really important <clears throat> tool to get this pandemic under control. We're also committed to patient safety. And uh, our message is that in doing this, we feel we're taking the route that <clears throat> will provide the most safety for the patient 
by um, by uh, enabling healthcare professionals to to recognize, to properly treat, and properly report any of the events that might happen. So, but the message to the patients. I think would be <laughs> to those who haven't been vaccinated would continue to be to get vaccines that are available to them to because uh, the risks from the pandemic are are significant and that the government is really looking into very carefully any safety problems so that they could be managed properly with this particular vaccine and all vaccines. Maybe I could expand, this is Dr. Shukit, just to say um, agree with Dr. Woodcock's assessment and, and just to remind clinicians and the public that 121 million people have been vaccinated with at least one dose of one of the three vaccines and the vast majority of the doses were of the other two products, the, the um, Pfizer and Moderna product. With our intensive safety monitoring, we have not detected this type of syndrome with the low platelets among the other vaccines. And we have real world evidence now of the vaccine's effectiveness in the US. So we're taking this um, pause and uh, precautions around the J&J product in the context of a large, robust, and highly safe and effective vaccination effort. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question. Thank you. Evan Brown, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, good morning. This is Evan Brown from Fox News. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the choice of words in your uh, announcements. You are recommending a pause uh, in the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but you are not ordering a stoppage. Is there a difference between the two? What would that difference be? Uh, and um, what would happen or what should happen? <clears throat> or what are your words to a state or a county or a nonprofit outfit that does not heed your recommendation? Thank you. Dr. Marks, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, th th thanks very much for that question. This is a recommendation and it's not a mandate. It's uh, out of an abundance of caution, we're recommending uh, that the vaccine uh, be paused in terms of its administration. However, if an individual healthcare provider has a conversation with an individual patient and they determine that the benefit risk for that individual patient is appropriate, we're not going to stop uh, that provider from administering uh, uh, the vaccine because it could be, right, in, in, in many cases, the, that benefit risk will be beneficial uh, overall to that uh, in individual in the large majority of cases. So um, again, we're recommending a pause out of an abundance of caution, but on an individual basis, a uh, provider and patient uh, can make a determination whether or not to receive the vaccine. Operator will take the next question. Thank you. Sarah Overman, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, thank you. This is Sarah Overmall from Politico. Um, going back to Caroline's question on subgroups, I know that there's a few cases now, but is there any thought of risk from linked to birth control because all of the women are of childbearing age? Um, and then also, obviously, there are six confirmed cases now, but probably more are going to come out as people recognize this. So is there a number? How many probable cases are, do you guys have on your horizon right now? Um, Dr. This, Mark, this is, yeah, Dr. I'm Shirley. happy to take this one. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks very much. Um, so um, at, at this time, uh, it's not clear that there's any association uh, with the oral contraceptive pill uh, birth control in uh, the individuals who had these um, blood clots. Um, additionally, I think it's too early to make any speculation on how many cases will come out. I do agree with you that it's possible we will learn of more cases, and that's part of the reason why we're taking the pause to try to ascertain that. But I, I cannot speculate on uh, how many more we'll learn of. Hopefully, it's just going to be a few. Okay. Operator will take the next question. 
Thank you. Leanne Winnick, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, I'm from CBS News, and I have actually have two questions. Um, as you mentioned that some people may have a conversation with their health care provider and decide that this is appropriate for them, but most people are going to mass vaccination sites and don't have that relationship. Are there certain risk factors that an individual would know from their medical history? And secondly, could you estimate the number of J&J &J that were meant to be given out in the, the days ahead and how that might affect the president's 200 million dose goal since his inauguration? Thanks. Either anyone would like to respond to this yeah. question? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, let, let me start with the second question first. I think um, the, the vaccine supply um, has become uh, more abundant over time. And I, you know, I think that this, uh, this temporary pause um, is, uh, is hopefully not going to have a large uh, adverse effect on making those goals. Uh, in a timely manner, if at all, if any at all. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, risk factors, I think those are, at this point, um, they are specific enough that, we, you know, um, to an individual that that's going to have to be a determination that an individual has with their health care provider. And I'll, I'll turn that over to Dr. Shuket since this is, it, she, she may have more to say about that. Yes, and thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, we're working right now from a, a, a small number from the six events that have been reported here in the U.S. And so while um, we're seeing them in, in women under 50, I think we are going to need to take some time and have our advisory committee on immunization practices take a, a additional time to review. Um, I, As my understanding is that there weren't um, predisposing conditions for this, uh, these events in at least some of those um, individuals. Um, and then the issue of supply, just to say that currently um, the J&J &J product had been providing um, the minority, uh, the, the great minority of doses. Um, every dose is precious and we're keen to get as many doses as possible administered as, as frequently, I'm sorry, as, as rapidly as possible and as equitably as possible, but um, it's too early for us to know the impact on the supply longer term. I couldn't hear what you said, Dr. Shuket. You said there were or were not pre-existing conditions in these six cases. Um, what I tried to say is there were not in all of them, so not to say that there may have been in some, but I think, you know, I think it's, a, I think my main point is that um, review of, of six is um, difficult to make generalizations from. Um, we're going to have our expert committee take a careful look, and we're, of course, trying to assure that providers will report um, suspect episodes so that they can be further investigated um, because the, the numbers are quite small, small enough that it's hard to generalize, but large enough that we wanted to take the, uh, action with the pause. Operator, we'll take our next question. Thank you. Helen Braswell, you may go ahead and please state your outlet. Hi, yes, it's Helen Braswell from STAT. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I think this is a question for Dr. Marks. Um, your remarks earlier suggest you think this is a class effect. Are you looking back through data of the various um, experimental um, adenovirus vector vaccines that have been produced over the years, the one GSK was making with NAID or the J&J &J Ebola vaccine for that matter, to, to see if there's uh, data there that can help you with this problem? Yeah, the simple answer is yes. We're going to look at the totality of the evidence available to us uh, that informs this. Um, so, yes. But do you think it is a class effect? Well, we, I, I, I hesitate to call it a class effect, but I think uh, what it, it is, it, um, it's plainly uh, obvious to us already that what we're seeing with the Janssen vaccines looks very similar uh, to what was being seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine. One is uh, the AstraZeneca is a chimpanzee adenoviral vector vaccine. The uh, Janssen is a 
human adenoviral vectored vaccines. So um, I, I think we, I can't make some broad statement yet, um, but obviously uh, they are from uh, uh, the same general class of, uh, of viral vectors. J&J is doing a two-dose trial. Have you asked them to pause that? I think you can look at uh, uh, statements that will come out of uh, J&J today um, uh, about their voluntary actions uh, about uh, in response to this request for a pause. Thank you. Operator, we will take our last question. Thank you. Dr. John LaPook, you may go ahead. Please state your outlet. Hi, Dr. John LaPook, CBS News. I'm wondering if you could help put this in perspective a little bit more. The CVST, you said, was about 2 to 14 per million. I assume that's per year <clears throat> in patients with normal platelets, and these six people, in order to annualize them, that's over, what, about the six weeks since authorization? Uh, that's probably correct. Right, right. So do we know what the, what the rate is in people with normal, with uh, low platelets? Because now it's the two to 14. It's, I mean, it sounds like it's like one in a million if it's six per six or seven million. That's very, very about what the background rate would be in people with normal platelets. But we're saying this is the, what makes this unusual is that they have the combination of uh, the low platelets and the clotting. So do we know what the background rate is in people who have the CVST and low platelets? This is Peter Marks. We don't. But we, what we do know is that this type of a uh, combination of low platelets and uh, and blood clots has been very rarely seen in the past in other situations as an autoimmune phenomenon, but it's very, very rare, such that I don't, I, I don't have an annualized rate that I can provide you. Because I can imagine as a clinician, I mean, headache, we're going to now see a lot of people with headache. Uh, the management specifics, I guess you, you didn't want to really go into, but it, I guess it's not anticoagulation standard. It's maybe some kind of thrombectomy or something. But I can imagine in the next couple of days, which is probably why you're rushing to get this assessed quickly, there's going to be a lot of phone calls to doctors like me. So I, maybe I can pass it over to, to Dr. Shukat in a moment. But I think the, the key, some of the key information here is that these have usually occurred at, at least about a week after vaccination and not longer than three weeks after vaccination. Um, uh, with a median of about nine days after vaccination. We know that for these vaccines, for the first several days after vaccination, there are flu-like symptoms, which can include headaches. So I think for the um, internists out there and the uh, primary care providers um, who are caring for patients, if they're seeing uh, flu-like symptoms and headache for the first few days after uh, vaccination, that is uh, likely just what has been seen in uh, the uh, common adverse events that are not serious um, uh, with these vaccines. It would be more important that if somebody presented to an emergency room with a very severe headache or um, with blood clots that uh, a history of prior vaccination be elicited and then uh, appropriate management uh, be instituted. So I think this is the uh, message that we need to get out to healthcare providers um, that if, if someone ends up with a very severe headache um, or uh, any type of shortness of breath, pain in their legs, um, uh, pain in their abdomen that's uh, uh, severe, that they would want to seek medical attention. And uh, if there are low platelets at that time, um, uh, one needs to consider this entity. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, this concludes today's media briefing. A replay will be available on the FDA's YouTube page. Um, and just to note, the FDA and CDC's press releases have been posted on our agency's website. Um, so thank you very much for joining today, and goodbye. And thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may go ahead and disconnect at this time.